Welcome everyone. Um, this week we have the honor and the privilege to have Professor Philip to give us a talk. So um, for those of you who know the company ARM, and I think we should all know that because um, we all use some of their services in our mobile phones and other portable devices. So Professor Ian Phillips is one of the co-founder of the company ARM. And he has been very supportive to our department Every year, he would come to our university and give us a talk in person. But this year, very unfortunately, due to the pandemic, and the travel couldn't be um, taking place, so we would have to have this talk online. If you can, please, um, can you clap your hands on your screen just to show our appreciation for his strong and kind support for so many years. Please, can you do that on your screen if you can, please? Thank you. I've got to find out how to display all of the uh, all the screen. Never mind. That's okay. I can see that on my screen. Thank you all for doing that. Hello, all right. Uh, hello. Yeah, for those who have just joined, please, can you switch off hello. your microphone, please? Yes. You're very welcome yes. to switch off your yes. microphone. Yes. Your microphone <laughs> <laughs> can you switch off your microphone? Okay. Yes. Um, so we, today, yeah, great. We'll take we'll take that as a sign. As the, the background noise has uh, has died down a little bit, so we'll take it as a sign that uh, we're going to start. Well, um, hi, everybody. Um, as the previous slide showed, I'm trying to imagine you all out there. And uh, of course, it's going to be quite difficult because this is my first um, virtual presentation that I've done, although no doubt you've had quite a few of them in the last in the last year or so. Um, so uh, I apologize for not being able to be there in person, but, but the first slide showed that I have certainly managed it in the past. OK, this is my talk. This is what I'm going to talk about today and uh, give you a little bit more information about it. So it's a case of how can I help you? Because what I want to do in all of these talks is to try and give you something that uh, I've not been able to uh, find out for yourself yet because you're, you're still only very young. And I've had somewhat more years in the in the uh, uh, business than you have and uh, so maybe there's something I can give you back now what I've tended to do of course in the past was to talk about technology so most of my my uh, earlier presentations and you can find all of those on the slide at the end which is called um, uh, references so no need to for you to write it down at the moment um, I've tended to present in, on technology but this time because I've been five years since I retired. I've been five years away from the coalface. So things are happening, of course. Technology is happening, and it's happening quickly. And in addition to that, I'm getting older, and the stuff that I know about is becoming, is becoming less relevant. And so I want to give you some information about my career, but I don't want it to be a long, boring presentation about, uh, about me and what I did. I also want to to highlight some of the major <laughs> traps, some of the major issues that I encountered, because hopefully you'll be able to find out those are useful to yourselves in your career. So moving right along. Right, and of course we're going to do it virtually. Um, again, you can imagine this situation because this is the, uh, uh, the large lecture theatre in, in Liverpool that I normally talk at. Well, my beginning, <clears throat> it's hard to imagine when you look at somebody who is 70 something sitting uh, facing you on the screen to, to think that I had a beginning. I was, a, uh, I was a, 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 an ordinary youngster and uh, I failed what was called the 11 plus exam, which is the exam at 11 in England, which um, decided really whether you went to the, uh, the grammar school, the top school, or whether you went to the secondary modern school, which was generally speaking, uh, the school for failures. And so I went to the secondary modern school. I was pretty handy, however. I was quite good at uh, the sort of physical subjects, woodworking, metalworking, 
uh, and also enjoyed maths and physics. So the, the move was in there, although in many respects I was now in the wrong time. Naim, can you turn off your microphone? The uh, Somebody muted me instead of somebody else. So I think, am I live? Can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Oh, that's yes, okay, yes. good. Right, so my first experience with electronics came when my dad decided that he was going to uh, give me some little projects to do. And the first thing I did was made a little electromagnetic buzzer. And I guess most of you will know how they work. And it excited me. And then my cousin, um, that for that, Christmas gave me a crystal set and I don't know how many of you know what crystal sets are but basically it's a tuned circuit with a diode and uh, you attach a long wire to it as an, as an aerial or as an antenna and you have a pair of headphones and theoretically at least you can tune it and listen to radio well it didn't work but nevertheless it got me interested and, uh, and so my dad introduced me to the guy across the road, a chap called Dave, and I can't remember his other name, who was a, an amateur radio enthusiast, a ham radio enthusiast. And for a while, I went up and I listened uh, to the radio traffic and I listened to him talking to people all around the world. And I found that absolutely fascinating. So I wanted to have a shortwave radio of myself for myself, but they were all so expensive. Uh, that Dave found me a circuit diagram and some components and enabled me to make my own radio. So I bent aluminium and I so learned to solder and I got my th first 300 volts electric shock. That's the, the advantages of serious radio as opposed to five volts or nine volts stuff, which you just don't feel. 300 volts, you feel. Um, I built it all and I built it as carefully as I could, but it didn't work. There wasn't many components in it, incidentally. We're talking one valve and a few resistors and, and capacitors. Um, but anyway, Dave took it away and he came back the next night and he had changed one resistor and it worked. Now, the thing that got me about that was Dave knew how it worked and he managed to change one resistor to another value because he knew that that's what it would need. And that fascinated me. So I wanted to know how it worked too. And so I bought a set of those manuals on the side. It was six books. And uh, they were basic electronic technician training books. And I read them. Uh, so this is as a probably 12 year old. I read them from cover to cover, cover and thoroughly enjoyed them. And mostly knew what was going, could understand what was going on. So I knew at that point that that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to do something in electronics. So as I said, I wasn't being very successful at school. And so my father, who, is, who read the local newspaper very closely, spotted a Ministry of Defense craft apprenticeship in electronics. So I applied, I won a position, four out of 50, not bad, and left school uh, without quali qualifications three months before my 16th birthday. And I did the apprenticeship. It was a four-year apprenticeship, part of which was supervised. Um, one part was, well, all of it was supervised. The first year was in a workshop, dedicated um, metalwork workshop. And the, uh, the following three years then were supervised. I worked with some uh, electronic engineers doing a quite exciting uh, Ministry of Defense electronic equipment maintenance. So radar and uh, exotic scopes and uh, high-speed cameras and things of that nature, really decidedly exciting. And at the end of that time, I came out with an ordinary national certificate. Now that's not really very big certificate. It's more, broadly speaking, is about two years below um, uh, or even three, three years below a degree level. So it's, uh, it's a good basic qualification, but that's all. Uh, but I worked at that point as an R&D engineer for one year before going to Swansea. So I entered to Swansea University. So I 
entered the university at 21, 1970 that was, that's a long time ago, and I wouldn't mind betting that's earlier than all of you were born. It was a four-year degree, because I didn't really have enough entry qualifications, but I left with a first-class honours in electrical and electronic in just two years. But I'd spent quite a lot of time doing this. It took me nine years to get from leaving school to, to getting my degree. But here I am, 47 years ago, I was here being in the audience with you, ready to take my first steps on the engineering career. Now, no doubt you will have had your own points of inspiration. You will have been enthusiastic enough to pursue higher qualifications. Your education was probably a bit muddled because most people's are, and you will have doubts about your abilities. I'm sure you do. You will have learned a little about life in university and having to come around the world for a lot of you, motivation, independence, and hard work. But hopefully you'll still be as excited about engineering and science as I was, because uh, I would love to have known something of what to expect for the next step, but there was no doubt that I was still excited about it. So what is it exactly is an engineer? Well, Einstein gave us some pretty good uh, definitions, actually. He said that scientists investigate that which already is. Engineers create that which has never been. These are, you would expect no less, of course. These are very deep uh, quotes. And I've, I've found over the years, this is, this is well worth remembering. A scientist investigates that which is all that which already is. He doesn't do something new. He tries to understand what nature has given us. Engineers are the ones that create products, and I'll use the word products, that essentially have never been before. So your pocket calculator is a simple thing, but your smartphone, your engine management units, etc., etc. And those definitions then, researchers identify and quantify components from a chaotic universe, I think is quite interesting because you're making as a engineer, you're creating things that have ne been, never been out of chaos. And a researcher essentially does the same thing. It finds valuable components out of a chaotic universe. Technicians are less interested in um, chaos in fact, what they are good at is knowing how to use what has already been found out uh, to use it properly and to understand and become expert at doing that. And then there's this other group, which I call modelers, which some people would say software engineers, but I'm using a different term here very purposefully because all software is a model. It's a model of a physical system or a physical existence and it is used to predict. So when you have a smartphone, for example, you turn it on, the smartphone um, expects you to be just about to set up a phone call. Um, now it puts up the appropriate icon, icons to support that. So it's predicting what your actions are going to be. It moves from one state to another making predictions. So I choose to call the software world modelers. And modelers create models of physical phenomena, but they do it in a virtual world. And this accounts for an awful lot of the difference between effectively what programmers do and what uh, research engineers or, and technicians do. Now, in point of fact, I think that there is the equivalence of engineer, researcher and technician in the modeling world. But I'm not presenting this to you as a statement of fact, I'm presenting this to you as a way of thinking, because I think you'll find that it's valuable for you to think of software, embedded software, or um, real-time software, or mainframe computer software. They're all models. Uh, the models predicting the weather, for example, uh, are, are creating a model of the weather systems, and then using that model to accelerate time so that you can see what will happen in local places um, as, as the days go by. <clears throat> now, the other thing is engineer or scientists or research or technician or a modelist. Truth is you're going to do all of these roles. 
in your work, you're not just going to be one of these things. You will do one of these things more than the rest, and that is who you are. So if you're doing most modeling and you're doing a bit of soldering and a little bit of, uh, uh, of logic design, then you might actually end up being a modeler. And so I think it's the, the term associated with engineer is very loose, and we'll come back to that. So, okay, 1974, then I got my uh, first serious job. So I had worked for a year as a graduate, as a uh, apprentice after apprenticeship. But now 1974, I joined a company called TMC, Telephone Manufacturing Company. And um, it was okay. I joined there as an R&D engineer, but they put me into making test equipment. And I was pretty upset by that because I wanted to do R&D, research and development and they've made me work in the pre-production department. Now, so I wasn't happy, um, but actually, I, looking back, I realized I was actually designing and programming some very interesting test equipment with a CPU built in from discrete TTL. You couldn't get them as chips in those days, um, but I didn't notice that. I didn't notice how exciting it was to be a design engineer in a pre-production department or in a manufacturing department. And I think this is a thing we have to be a bit careful of because the only good jobs, if you like, the only sexy jobs are not just designing a product. There is a product is all of those things. It has to, you have to include manufacture, you have to include test, and you have to include product design, of course. But those other things are just as important because you don't have a product if you don't have them. So, I heard that the design department, however, was closing in London and moving down to where I was based. And so I promptly requested an internal transfer and was very soon designing one of the first custom integrated circuits in the UK, 1977. Tiny by today's standards. I don't remember how many gates there was, but it wouldn't have been more than a few hundred. And it used a logic scheme called four-phase dynamic logic, which I had never heard of at the time, and you will never have heard of either, but it's worth looking it up just for interest's sake, because it's a very low power, very dense layer uh, logic methodology. And um, certainly I've looked at it a couple of times as a possible way for solving a design problem that I was facing over the years. And the EDA that we used was pencil and paper and slide rule. Um, turned out I was quite good at this, and I even wrote and presented a training course for the other engineers in the company. Uh -huh. Now, I think other people had noticed that I was quite good at it, because shortly I was invited to join a team designing what was called a small business telephone system, which was a, uh, a telephone system for uh, offices, um, and it used uh, data communication and uh, analog audio, a sort of hybrid. And um, it was the, an, a, a first, and it was designed for British Telecom, which was the UK's uh, telecoms company of the, te of the day. And um, there was a lot to do. Uh, we not only had to design the chip, we had to design the circuits, we had to design the uh, plastic casework, everything. And it was chaos. And this is where I, th I think I first met chaos. We were a team, we pulled together, and somehow we muddled through. It took four years, but it was successful in production and in the market. Wow, brilliant. I'd, I'd done this, I'd designed or been involved in, seriously involved in the design of this system, and it worked, it was easy. Just had to keep doing that now with other more exciting things. Well, I wouldn't be honest with you if I didn't say, that failure happened too. And my first failure happened very soon afterwards. I did a couple of other small projects, but then I was given a, a team of three design engineers and the primary development component in it was a large complex chip and it didn't work ever. The product missed its market window. So there was no chance to rework it. And the project was abandoned. It was an expensive mistake, about a million pounds worth back in 1984, you think about that. Um, 
Worse was I had failed in management as well as technology. It was my failure. I had failed to, uh, to research the, and prepare the methodology necessary for designing that chip. Um, and I felt very bad about it, and I still do to a certain extent. And yet, it wasn't the end of the world. I didn't lose my job. And the, it started to dawn on me that management was actually investing in me, and they didn't want to lose me. So what they wanted to do was to make sure that I was not asked to do the thing that I hadn't done very well next time, but to do the things that were more suited to my skills. And that's what I did. And I ended up leading a new research group, just one person, me, reporting directly to the technical director, who was the chief technical honcho in the, in the business, really to support the evaluation of his ideas and the business opportunities that they came up with. Well, I enjoyed that. It was much, I was much better at this. And I soon had a small team again, um, only three or four people, but nevertheless, it was doing this exciting stuff. So through the years, and there has now been quite a lot of them, failures happened. Uh, and 100% success almost never happened. So I got pretty close on lots of occasions, but 100% is very, is very difficult. And occasionally I lost my department again and again, and it hurts, and it hurts just as much the second time and the third time. But looking back, and I think this is important, every time I failed, I got a chance to focus more precisely on what I'd been good at. It's unreasonable to expect that chaos would always resolve in product successes, but businesses expect it to. They expect you to succeed. And when it does fail, they don't penalize you. It just means that it's a lost market opportunity and there's lots of lost market opportunities. Businesses not surprisingly then prefer people who are lucky and who can blame them. Um, but they also need people who are brave. Those people are gonna stick their neck out and do something difficult because in doing it, they're going to achieve a product which is better. Just a uh, reminder, I suppose, today, the budget rates for an engineer is 250,000 pounds a year. That's a lot of money, but that also means that if they put you onto a job, then you're there for a reason. They're expecting it to be difficult. And they don't want, they're not gonna give you 10 other engineers because that's just plain expensive. So you're gonna be expected to work hard because that's how much it costs to sit you there. <clears throat> now I'm going to buzz, buzz through these a little bit, but the slides will be available and you can read them all. Um, but in 1965, Moore's Law was coined. And of course, I think you all know what Moore's Law is. You also know that it started to run out and pretty well effectively ran out about 2010, maybe 2015. But it, during that time, the number of transistors you could put on a die moved from eight to a hundred million, eight to a hundred million. I say that because eight is such a small number. And if you look at my timeline, then you will also find that my apprenticeship started in 1965 and I re retired in 2016. I had a working life which accompanied Moore's Law. And it started then at TMC, which I've already talked about. And I ended up designing ever more complex electronic telephone systems and ICs. Every year to two years, the amount the IC got effectively twice as big and the EDA tools I was using struggled more and more. And we didn't know how to do things because they hadn't been problems before. And ultimately we changed to CMOS and ultimately we started to have to do verification and, uh, and all sorts of additional things. Um, then I spent 13 years in Plessy, Plessy Semiconductors as MOS design manager. And there I was first responsible for bringing a process out of the research labs of process along with the gate array and ASIC technology and EDA tools. And that was interesting because in many respects, it should have just been a case of pick it up and put it down in the fab. Well, actually it was much more complicated than that, but it emphasized in the beginning that research is not a product. A product has been productized and that costs effort and takes time 
but of course it's much more robust. Research has demonstrated that something is possible. So I guess I succeeded a bit in that, um, in that I didn't fail entirely. Um, and as a result of that, I was, was pushed forward. Um, now, the other thing that came out during this time was I was still doing um, unusual work. And one of the things that I needed to do was to differentiate our gate array and um, uh, ASIC based design methodology. And so I started looking for a CPU core because I thought it would be a good idea if we could have a CPU core available in the cell library. I didn't really know what it meant. But I did find a small company based in Cambridge, which is called, which was called um, Arm, sorry, Advanced Risk Machines, which subsequently became Arm, which was a spin out of Acon computers at the time. And I made a methodology based on those uh, in conjunction with Arm. And though it turned out to be successful for Arm, it turned out to be a failure for Plessy. And I think that's that's interesting. Plessy is a company didn't adopt it wholeheartedly. It was just looking for something to fill a fab. Whereas ARM, of course, was totally dependent on this for uh, a methodology to develop their, their business. And so they, they, uh, became, they became involved and committed to it. So there was a lot of overlap at this time between Plessy and, my, and um, ARM and myself. And then, not surprisingly, I then went to join ARM. Um, and spent 18 years at, at that point um, as principal staff engineer and realized again, I was called principal staff engineer, but I actually spent an awful lot of time doing things which were not strictly engineering, marketing, sales, business plans, uh, persuading people about things which were a good idea, a lot of communication. Um, but the arm wanted me to do this. They'd seen what I'd done in Plessy and they were pleased with that. And so I was uh, one of the prime movers, not only in the IP-based design methodology, but also the AMBER bus methodology, the structure by which all of these cells are gonna be combined together. Well, by now I wasn't doing this hands-on. What I was doing was dropping the ideas and letting people pick them up and, and run with them. And so it was great, greatly satisfying to see these things develop uh, and move forward. During the course of this, uh, the research department, which I'd specified, um, rose from zero to 200 um, and close uh, and establishing close relationships with over 40 top worldwide universities. I also became a regular speaker and consultant to the government, EU and industry and a visiting professor at the University of Bath, Plymouth and Liverpool, of course where I've given an annual seminar since 2009. And then in 2016, I retired. Boy, this is a shock, because it's the end of your career. There's no more, there's no more promotion, there's no more demotion, there's no more competition. You stop doing it. <coughs> now, new challenges excited, excited me during this whole period. Almost every day, something new was coming up. I had several jobs, several things that were on my list of, of things I must do, and new ones were being added to the list far faster than I was ticking them off. Some were forced on me. I was asked to look at specific things. Others weren't. I did them because I was interested. And the main, I obviously succeeded often enough for Arm to keep employing me. And in the main, I was doing what I liked most identifying those technical issues and working to smooth them out for the benefits of my employer. And yes, it was challenging and stressful. And yes, there probably wasn't many weeks when I did 37 and a half hours, usually much longer. But it was me that chose that. Um, the good news was by now I had established little management responsibility. So I didn't have to do reviews, budgets, staffing uh, and coaching and recruiting, etc. cetera. Um, so was I an engineer? Well, all I could say that was at 68, the pressure of keeping up was begin beginning to tell. And so my final career choice was to retire. It seems engineering had become a huge part of me, however, because when I stopped doing it, it left a great big hole. So maybe I had been an engineer all along. 
So I really concluded that engineer is something that you may want to do, but it's not a, a specific destination, it's a journey. So I was declared an engineer first at the age of 20 when I was an MOD apprentice. I later joined TMC who called me an R&D engineer. Now the thing about that was interesting and annoyed me to start with there, there was four years in between when I've been to, to university and I was still called an R&D engineer. <coughs> was my degree worth nothing? So in due course, I joined the IERE, which became the IET. They called me an engineer. I registered with the engineering council who called me a chartered engineer. And in due course, I became a senior engineer in TMC because my, my boss said so. And throughout, I was known as an engineer throughout all my jobs. And it didn't change when I was doing management, methodology, research, marketing, even sales. So it all seemed rather informal for my liking. So I conclude that engineer is just a title. Being a professional and ethical one is a personal choice. It's a one that I chose. Sometimes it's hard to be ethical and personal, professional and ethical, but it is, it is good for your soul. If you've been a, a professional and ethical engineer, then you are happy. You've not cheated anybody and you've, you've done a good job as you were capable of doing. I did learn that being respected my, by my peers was the most highly valued uh, thing. So it wasn't what the IET called me or um, uh, what my particular job title was. But it did register with me that the public also suffered from this problem. The public thinks an engineer is a specific role, but actually the, without a public image, without an, in, an image which corrects that image, that view that the public has, then engineering will never have a public priority. And uh, as a result of which it will always be in a difficult position. So you still with me? Aha, uh -huh, you look like you are. So the first thing then to learn, these are specific points which I've picked out. <coughs> Whatever your educational background, when you leave college, when you leave formal training, you are going to be entering work on the bottom rung. You've acquired basic scientific knowledge, some limited specialist skills and have um, some application experience, not a lot. You're junior, nothing wrong with that. Um, but it's important to realize that you've got to carry on with that because if you don't apply what, what you've learned, then you never get familiar with its use. And without reinforcement, you have never learned to become less, what you have learned will become less usable. And without developing it, taking it further, what you've learned doesn't keep up because technology is advancing. So you've got to be very careful to make sure that you build on what you've learned because what you've learned fades. It fades away. What you know fades away with a half-life of about, of about two or three years. That's startlingly fast. Um, but it also says that you can, but you, if you use it, what you've got consolidates and it grows because you pick up new experiences and you go on new training courses and so on. So what you know, as what you know expands, it specializes you because you're going to pick up training which is associated with the job that you're doing. So make sure that you become the specialist that you want to be. And I think this is the start of asking you to think about your career because your career is your career. Business wants to use you to develop its products. <coughs> the interests can be aligned but they don't have to be. So alternative to engineering specialization, the good news here is if it all gets too much for you somewhere along the way, then there is um, escape paths. You can go into technician, you can go into marketing, you can go into sales. They're all honorable professions. Uh, it, isn't, it isn't failing as a design engineer. It's recognizing that your career should go a different way. But it also says that continued professional development, CPD, means a lifetime of commitment 
you want to be an engineer, you've got to continue learning all the time. <clears throat> now, my most persistent knowledge then, interestingly, is still the engineering fundamentals. <coughs> These served me well throughout my whole electronic technology uh, year, years, even though I started with training which included valves in the curriculum um, and used log tables and slide rules for calculation. But I learned new things as I went along and transistors came in and I learned more about those on the job than I did. Um, and of course, I learned out how to design integrated circuits in the same way. Um, but those engineering fundamentals, which you will have spent a lot of time doing, will still be very valuable to you in all kinds of different ways. Uh, it's the thing which enables you to look laterally, orthogonally at a problem and to see a way of doing it, which others haven't thought about. It's a strength of being an engineer. The skills I used again and again are bigger than the ones that I learned in college. I did learn maths, physics, materials, electrical, electronics, and magnetics, and basic programming. But subsequent to that, I had experience of manufacturing and tests, some workshops, presentations, analytic and logic skills. You know, the me isn't a static thing. The me is evolving. <coughs> Well, I'm going to introduce the engineering team then, because these are the four characters I talked about earlier, the scientist, the engineer, which uh, Einstein defined. And he was defining it instantly to identify himself as a scientist, um, to which I added technicians and modelers. As I said before, these are my definitions. You don't have to use any of these, but it is useful to think of these as all part of the team. The team is the creation of something which is involving the manipulation of the 118 elements that we have available to us to create the functional objects that humans desire, the smartphones, the engine management systems, the cars, and with a high degree of predictability and confidence. We say boldly, we can make this integrated circuit. We understand how logic works. It's purely a case of working out the logic, it, we can make the IC, we know how much it's going to cost to do it, and we can predict with a high degree of confidence what the outcome of an engineering process is. All other disciplines are envious of engineering's control of the future. So we are magicians, guys. Uh, you're going out there to do magic, and sometimes the magic is going to go wrong, but in the main, you're far more accurate, far more reliable than the sort of predictions that economists make <coughs> or <coughs> stock bro brokers, excuse me. <coughs> um, Prince Philip, late Prince Philip, <coughs> also produced, produced this little quote, which I think is very nice. Everything not invented by God is invented by an engineer. That's a very strong thing. But when you look around you, all the things that don't grow naturally have been put there by an engineering team at some stage. They've been regularized and manufactured, but our influence is phenomenal, not just in the electronic domain. <clears throat> so products then. A product is what is sold to an end customer for money. <coughs> it's more than just the electronics and the software in the center of the system. It also includes design of the factory, the test equipment, packaging, mechanics, optics, etc. It also includes getting the finance and the business model sorted out and supplying the, um, the food chain to make sure that all of the components that you needed are going to be there when you need to make the thing, and also that you have distribution channels. There's a lot of things which go into making a product, and it doesn't help if you take the position that, well, I did my bit right, um, these all have to be together. A, a product which has got any of these missing is a failed market opportunity. So we are part of a team. There is the engineering team, which I've talked about, but there is the wider team. 
And to put it into context as well, unless you go into a very small company, you, you will seldom be working on your own. You are almost always going to be part of a team. And you will seldom have just one challenge at a time. You will have a higher pro highest priority one, but you'll have other things that you're working on. And your purpose then is to help to get the product out functional, on time, on budget, using the skills which you're good at, these, those engineering or those research skills, <coughs> or those technician skills, or the modeling skills. No special rewards for getting it right. That's what you're paid to do. Um, so everybody gets to keep their jobs when the product gets out. That doesn't sound quite right, does it? Everybody's so used to being rewarded when they, when they do something right. In this business, you're rewarded. Your pay packet rewards you. You're paid quite well. <coughs> and sometimes there will be other opportunities as well that come your way. Not illicit ones, legitimate ones. But your job is what you're paid to do. Time is always a big surprise as well, because um, you seem to think or you seem to get the impression that product development happens fairly quickly. Well, let me tell you, it's quite a long way from that. To, to do anything significant in business takes 12 months, anything significant. It usually takes three years or frequently even a decade to get something from first concept through to a product. These these activities, these projects that you're involved in, you may be involved in one which is going to mature in, in 12 months, but you are also involved in some research work associated with one which is going to mature in 10 years. So this is exciting things, but that's how, it, that's how you will be working. So your team helps you to learn, but they also learn from you. Now, it's, it is important, I said to you in the beginning, that you're not going to be an expert, but you will come in bringing some knowledge that other people don't have. So you have to contribute. You have to contribute that knowledge because then people will value you. And at the same time, you have to listen. You have to be in, in the room participating. <coughs> you have to be in the room to learn. You have to stay in the room to contribute. And if you look at some of my earlier presentations, there's whole presentations about this. Um, but if you do work on your own, make sure you go on courses because you're learning a lot from, from your peers. And if you're not with a group of, uh, of peers, then you're missing out on that learning and you have to compensate for it. So if it wasn't difficult then, remember this, they wouldn't have employed an engineer to do it. So they expect failures to happen, even though they want this one to succeed. So nobody, still nobody loves a failure. Everybody recognizes that they happen, but it's not, they don't want this project to fail. They want this project to be the to one that succeeds. And so nobody loves failure. It's hard to avoid blame, recrimination, and self-doubt, but failure allows you time and time again to sharpen your skills and learn from it. You learn much more from failure than you do from success. Research is a mechanism to reduce the probability of failure in design. Um, design is an expensive process and research is relatively cheap. So it's a good thing to find out fundamental problems before you have to start spending lots of money. Your career then. Primarily when you go to work, it is to make, it is to make money for your employer. Don't forget it. It's all too easy to think that you're there because of developing you. You're not, you're there to make money, to make products. Your employer is interested in the best for the company and your best interests will come second. Doesn't mean to say they can't be aligned, but beware. Think how you are being developed and think where you would like to be because you can use the training opportunities that you'll get to help to prepare for that future. But at the same time, be realistic in your plans. You have to know yourself. Are you really the right person to do the job that you think you want to do? Because if you're not the right person, then you won't suit certain jobs. So the personality matters. 
um, and we'll come back to that in a moment. Your degrees are just your entry ticket. They help, they give you something in the background, they enable you to call yourself doctor perhaps, um, but they, it's what you did with them that really counts. And after just a few years, maybe even after five years, how you got to doing that job depends a lot less on your qualifications and on more on what you've been doing over that period of time. Degrees fade, they only maintain their value for three to five years, so don't waste them. Taking time out can be very expensive. And remember that the older you get, the more difficult it is to change tracks because you pick up baggage. Partners, children, friends, houses, etc., tie you to an area. And it becomes much more of a decision to move, to change employers or to change uh, your, your topic. So make sure you don't stray. Make sure you make good decisions as much as possible. You can't be right all the time, but you can try. And then titles. Well, what you're doing is what you are. Now I'm going to introduce a couple of things fairly quickly. I'm, <coughs> I'm all right for time, but uh, I don't want to spend too much time talking on these because a lot of you will feel like an imposter. Maybe uh, every, other people seem to be much cleverer than you. Uh, you're a little bit worried about whether you're actually going to be able to do the job when you get out there. And this is a side effect of what uh, of a basic of a basic fundamental that the more you learn about something, the the more you're aware of how little you know. You follow the negatives in that, but essentially, the more you know, the less you know. Uh, it makes you feel substandard and to be unnecessarily reticent, to be too hesitant because you're afraid of being wrong. It's known as the imposter, imposter syndrome and is very common in scientific professionals. So if you are not a, a person with the imposter syndrome, then in this business, you're fairly unique. You just have to be confident. You have to recognize that other people are observing you and they're calling you engineer and they're giving you credit for expertise and things like that. And you've got to believe them. The other thing is, are you technically able but a social failure? <coughs> this is Asperger's, a mildly autistic person with an IQ which is greater than 70, so no, not necessary to be a genius, no learning difficulties, a surfeit of quantitative and a deficit of qualitative social skills, makes you an Asperger's personality. Now, there's a large percentage of the scientific community are going to be Asperger's. Um, there's no cure for it because it's not a defect. It's just a variety of normal. There are around 5% of the population is on the autism spectrum somewhere, but around four times that number are present in the scientific and professional domains. It also means that most people that you encounter will find you a bit odd or boring. Um, autumn is, it, autumn is Sorry, autism occurs in around half the number of females, but it's less noticeable for complex reasons. And indeed, it's not absolutely sure that half is the right number. It's independent of race, upbringing and era. Worldwide, there's the same levels and it's not a genetic failure. It's more common in families where one or more parents are autistic. It's also known as the genius gene, although it technically is nothing to do with that. It's only because the group is self-selecting. It's self-selecting for people who've got an IQ greater than 70 and don't have learning difficulties. Otherwise, it, we would just be part of the same bell curve with everybody else. Many universities offer free tests to students for Asperger's. Take one. They cost a lot to do it privately, I found out. So I'm an Aspie with imposter syndrome. I've known about my imposter syndrome for a long time. And the more you know about a subject, the more you, you realize how little you know. So that's a repetition of the earlier statement. But it helps you to introduce, to understand when people introduce you as an expert. There's no cure for that. So you never really believe what other people say about you. But you just carry on. And after a little while, you nod and you say, yeah. But actually, you know that what you did wasn't really that clever or... Uh, 
Yeah, you, it, it would have been better if it had been done by somebody else, for example. But stick with it. Asperger's profile, I was only diagnosed three years ago after I'd retired. I wish I'd known much earlier. And I'll let you read that. Um, it's made, it would have made a lot of difference to my life from my first steps right through my family life, um, through my engineering life. And I would have been able to do a lot to compensate for it by what's called masking. So if you do have the opportunity to check yourself, it is worth knowing it. Membership of the professional engineering institutions then. Let's think in terms of the IET. Um, get this round the right way. The Engineering Council is the, is, the, uh, regu is the registration that you want to see. This is the gold standard, the Engineering Council or the Science Council, because this lists you on a register of professional people who have agreed to behave in a professional and an ethical way. So it, that's the thing which is worthwhile having because those letters, in my case, CENG, mean I'm a chartered engineer. And it tells any, anybody who's looking for an engineer who employs me to do it, that I have uh, made a commitment to be a professional and an ethical engineer. To be a member of the IET, is perhaps less, uh, less uh, important because really all that does, because they accredit academic programs, membership of those bodies really only uh, registers that you have gone through one of their accredited training programs. They tend to sell it as being a lot more important than, it, than registration, but actually registration is the most important thing. You can only become registered by being a member of one of these uh, bodies like the IET. Now, is it worth paying for this? And I think this is probably the little awkward one because throughout my working life, I've paid to be a member of the IET. And I've got to say that in 46 years, I hope there would have been some change, but there's not. I currently sit on the engineering count of the council of the IET, trying to make a change. So I should think that it's worthwhile. Well, many of the greatest engineers that I've known, very few are members or registered. Draw your own conclusions on that. So I feel that it should be obligatory to practice engineering or science, but it's not. So you must make that decision for yourself. Um, if you want it to change into the, into the institution that you want it to be, then you've got to get involved. That part of it is certainly true. So my last but one slide, some things that uh, I hoped I'd have a moment to say. <coughs> they didn't fit into any of the other ones. But be enthusiastic, be enthusiastic and committed. People like people who are enthusiastic. Uh, if you like your job, that should be easy. And if you're not afraid of risk, that should be easy. So it's exciting. Opportunities are exciting. Take, always see them that way. You will usually be employed for a 37 and a half hour week, but because you'll be judged by completing the work, then you usually do more than that. And you, because you're your own judge, you'll also be asking yourself, am I giving value for money? Have, have I worked on a lot of good things this week? And if you're not happy, you will push yourself to deliver even more. So engineering is not an easy ride by any means. Dress is important. Um, I put mirroring because you can look up mirroring. The whole business of how you interact with a person is important. But the dress is the start of that. It is just a uniform, so don't get hung up on it. You may have rights to wear a T-shirt in a posh meeting. But actually, if you want to have a good relationship with the other people who are in that meeting, then it's important to dress appropriately. And on a business trip or a training course where alcohol usually flows quite freely and you're encouraged to, to be open and uh, perhaps a little irresponsible, you have to remember that you're never off duty. Be professional and be composed day or night. You're being paid to be there. So make sure you contribute and make your allegiance known. Hi there, I'm Ian Phillips from Arm. It doesn't take much to say that. I've got a problem. I've got a question, whatever. 
And the other thing I tended to do too was as I'm listening to your presentation, think of a question, write it down. If you um, think during the, during the presentation of a better question, write that down and then get there. And the first time I say, when they say any questions, you're there with your hand up, you got the question, you ask it and you announce yourself, you and Philip's from on. And they ask the question, it's good. People get to recognize you. You've always got a question, it's always a good one. Business needs cautious engineers, but it also needs bold ones, but not too bold. Innovation is suppressed by engineers being overcautious. It leads to market failure because the product doesn't come up to people's expectation. However, over-innovation leads to technical failure. So trying to do too much or using new, new technology before it's ready all lead to technical failures. Either kind of failure is a failure, product failure. We don't want that, do we? So domestically, your family and friends will never understand what you do for a living. Your family will expect you to work 37 and a half hour a week. That's a tricky one. Your family will expect you to have other interests and topics of conversation. Hmm. Especially if you're an Aspie, those are quite difficult things to deliver. But if you want to have a family life, you've got to learn to do some of that. So in conclusions then, businesses are about making money. Uh -uh. Engineers are costly, but they are a cost to be minimized. So you won't get 10 engineers to do a job. You'll always, you'll always be pressed to do it with three. Um, but they do find problems and because they're ingenious and because they do fix the problems, they have to be there. What you are, what you, sorry, you are what you do and what you do is your CV for your next job either in the company or in the next company that you want to move to. I was in those companies for 12, 13 and 18 years. And it wasn't because I couldn't be, bo be bothered. It's because I kept getting new jobs. I wasn't doing the same thing in those companies for all that period of time. So you don't have to change your job to get a new and exciting role. Just keep moving, keep looking, keep taking the opportunity. <coughs> Remember that your career is yours look after it carefully and remember to succeed you need to be in the room in the room where decisions are taken in the room where engineering is discussed people need you to be there they need to invite you into that room so you have to be a contributor so did i achieve my goal of becoming an engineer well i think the answer must be yes though as an imposter of course i still have my doubts so thank you very much for listening. That brings me to the end of my presentation. And uh, if there is any questions, I'll quite happily take them if the system will support it. But there is a, um, come on, there should be, yes, a references slide. Um, my email address is at the bottom there, next to six. Um, and there's a couple of other ones which are uh, earlier presentations that I've done at the University of Liverpool, not making smaller atoms and staying in the room. They're individual uh, 45 minutes presentations. So if you were interested in some of the, some additional information, then you can go there and see it. In my index of presentations, you can see all of my presentations that go back to 2009 and indeed earlier. More about Asperger's, more about imposter syndrome and more about the engineering councils. So that's it. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Professor Phillips. Um, any question, please, from the audience? Feel free to ask to unmute yourself or type over here. I think it has been a remarkable 12 years. Thank you, um, Ian. So many of the thanks for the inspiring talk and the advices and career choices. So I'm sure that the many students, students like myself are looking upon and admiring your achievements. <laughs>